Hi, welcome to You and Your Health. I'm your host, David Bertone. Today's topic is osteoarthritis and the possibility of joint replacement surgery for, for those that have significant osteoarthritis throughout their life. The statistics have shown that throughout the United States, over 780,000 joint replacements have been performed. That statistic rises dramatically, um, and in the year 2030, we predict there will be over 2 million joint replacements performed in the United States. Our guest today is Dr. Michael Cunningham. Dr. Cunningham is an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in joint replacement surgery. Dr. Cunningham has a practice locally here in Homedale. Dr. Cunningham, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dave. Tell us a little bit about your background and um, your specialty in orthopedics. Yes, I'm, as you said, a, a board-certified orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I've been practicing in the uh, Homedale uh, area, uh, Hazlitt area, for approximately 15 years. Uh, prior to coming to this area, I was in the United States Air Force for a four-year period, during which time uh, I uh, gained a lot of experience, uh, not only with uh, joint replacement, uh, but also with sports medicine types of uh, procedures due to the uh, active duty uh, population. Um, right now, I specialize mainly in sports medicine and joint replacement types procedures. Uh, I am active on staff at multiple hospitals, including uh, Bayshore Community Hospital, Riverview Medical Center, and the Raritan Bay uh, Medical Center. Great. And is that where you primarily perform your procedures? Yes. Uh, at the present time, all of the joint replacement procedures are, are performed in one of these hospitals. Okay. Great. I think it's important for us, before we get into osteoarthritis and the surgeries, is to talk a little bit about, very basically, about the hip and the knee joint, because that's really where we're going to be focusing today. Right. In terms of the anatomy of the hip joint, wh why is this a, a very common area for a joint replacement surgery? Well, the hip is actually the second most common joint to be replaced behind the knee. And the reason is all multiple in nature. Uh, osteoarthritis is a result of a sort of a complex process, but we think of it as a, uh, a wear and tear process. So throughout life, as one ages, the stresses on the hip joint are very great. It's a weight-bearing joint, and everyday activities, uh, whether it be walking, running, uh, twisting, and turning, in some way stress the hip joint. And so the accumulation of the stresses throughout one's uh, uh, lifetime and activities uh, ultimately, in many cases, will result in the uh, osteoarthritis, which again is a breakdown of the cartilage lining of the hip joint. Okay, can you show us on one of the models what, in terms of anatomy, I know it's a ball and a socket joint. Where is this cartilage located and, and, and um, just give people a basic understanding of the anatomy of the hip joint? Yes, yeah, sure. Now these models that I'll be showing actually already have sort of a replacement prosthesis in them, but if you can imagine that this is still bone continuing up to this level with a ball on the end of the bone. This is called the femur. This is the thigh side of the socket. And this is the, the ball that goes into the cup, which is on the pelvic side of the hip joint. Normally, the ball and the cup are both covered with a thick layer of glassy-like cartilage, which is very smooth and has a very low coefficient of friction to allow easy gliding between the two. And this is how a normal hip joint should be and is when it's functioning well. And when that cartilage starts to break down, wear and tear, um, it, that's when people start having limited motion and pain, right? Yes, that's correct. When arthritis occurs, the cartilage will wear down, and instead of having that smooth, glassy, low coefficient of friction cartilage, it's replaced by the underlying bone, which is rough and grinding. And so now, instead of being a smooth gliding effect, there is a grinding, snapping, crunching effect. And that's why people who do develop arthritis feel the grinding, clicking, snapping sensations in the joint because 
they're having this bone on bone uh, rubbing instead of the glassy cartilage. Sure. Now, how does the knee joint differ in terms of the anatomy? Um, and um, is you said it's more prevalent in terms of joint replacement surgery. Yes. Um, just give us a little background on some of the anatomy and how the cartilage differs in the knee joint. Yes. Well, the knee is a is a different type of a joint. This is a model of a knee joint, and of this is the, the, the patella or the kneecap which glides in front of the joint and I'm pointing to the cartilages or the, the meniscus cartilages inside the knee joint. So when an athlete tears a cartilage, this is what is actually being referred to which is the cushioning cartilage of the knee joint. These cartilages normally act to support the joint deepen the space and protect the cartilage that lines the bone. Similar to the hip joint, there is a glassy, smooth cartilage on both ends of the bone in the knee joint as well. This is the femur side and this is the tibia, the shin bone side. And in between is the protective, cushioning meniscus cartilage. Now, many times Again, because the knee is a weight-bearing joint, it also undergoes the stress of everyday life. There are many twisting and pivoting activities that occur, and this stresses the ligaments and the cartilages around the knee joint, many times resulting in tears of the cartilage, which in turn creates inflammation and pain and exposes the underlying articular cartilage, the smooth, glassy cartilage, to damage. Uh, and as a result, with time, as these cartilages start to wear away, or in many cases, a patient may undergo a knee arthroscopy uh, to remove a torn cartilage, this exposes more of the articular cartilage to stress, and with time, that cartilage starts to wear away, resulting in, again, that sort of bone-on-bone -bone deformity that we talked about with the hip. Okay. Now, uh, obviously, the ri there's, there's several risk factors for this to happen. There's traumatic reasons for people to undergo joint replacement surgery, but let's talk about more of the routine degenerative joint disease that we see um, leading to joint replacement surgery. So what are those risk factors for people to think about? Right. Well, commonly, um, as one ages, one develops a greater chance of developing osteoarthritic change. Now, some people, for reasons that are not quite clear, are more susceptible to, de to developing these kinds of changes. And um, trauma is definitely related, and microtrauma on a daily basis, quote unquote, wear and tear. Okay. But there are also genetic reasons. Osteoarthritis does tend to run in families. We're not quite clear on the exact genetic um, reason why this occurs, but it's known to occur. Um, additionally, there are other reasons uh, that one can develop uh, outside of a uh, major trauma, and those mainly have to do with uh, previous surgeries for unrelated kinds of issues. Uh, including arthroscopy of the hip joint, arthroscopy of the knee joint, um, and uh, things of that nature. What about things like uh, obesity and smoking no. history and, and, and those right. factors? Are they an issue? Uh, obesity is certainly an issue with the development of especially uh, knee arthritis, and unfortunately, especially in women. Because of the shape of the women's uh, pelvis, it's a little bit wider, and the stresses across the knee joint are a little bit different than the male stressors. Obesity uh, creates a predilection for the development of osteoarthritis, especially in the, in the knee joint. Okay. Um, now, when a patient first comes into you, and uh, let's, let's take somebody that's a little bit more chronic. They've been undergoing several types of therapies or medication. What is the workup to make that decision? What are some of the factors that you look at to say, maybe it's time to consider a joint replacement? Right. Well, first, we do look at what kinds of treatments that the patient has had before. Uh, 
Simply put, we do recommend diet and exercise to deal with any potential obesity issues. Uh, additionally, uh, the patient is usually uh, placed on a physical therapy or an exercise program that enables conditioning of the muscles around that joint. Uh, and that seems to help uh, at least delay the need for a, a knee or a hip replacement in many instances. And then what do you consider as the, uh, once they start losing function, wh when, is the, when is the time where you say, listen, I think it's time for you to consider this? Well, that really is based on the patient's pain level. When a patient reaches a point where conservative management uh, is no longer effective, and they're having difficulty performing the activities of their daily life or participating in the kinds of recreational activities that they would like to participate in, it's time to start thinking about more aggressive procedures like doing a knee or a hip replacement. Okay. Um, so when they, is there any other testing or workups that you would consider prior or things that you need prior to considering the surgery? Well, we always, uh, as a matter of routine, uh, obtain at least x-rays to evaluate the condition of the joint. Now, we don't try to treat the x-ray, we try to treat the patient. Um, as a general rule, if patients are having pain around the clock, interfering with their sleep patterns, and just overall making their lives a little bit miserable, those are the patients who uh, are the best candidates to undergo a, a, a replacement. Are there, are there some advances to the medications in terms of anti-inflammatories that are considered or some other um, things? I know that there's cartilage replacement surgeries and things like Synvisc and things to help in, improve the lubrication of the joint. Are there things that you consider as well? Yes, the, and that would all be part of the conservative management that we consider uh, before going ahead and moving to the point of recommending the uh, knee or, or hip replacement. Um, with the knee uh, specifically, uh, we do use hyaluronate or cartilage material replacement, and that is done by e a series of injections. The number varies from one to possibly five, but what it does is it restores a uh, boundary layer of lubrication it gives a shock absorber effect and also has a direct pain relieving effect for about a six to twelve month period. Many patients will obtain good relief with that. In addition, patients can use anti-inflammatory medications such as Advil or ibuprofen, naproxen, or many different, uh, different types of specific uh, prescription medications, or uh, Tylenol. Um, other forms of non-operative management would include uh, bracing, where a brace can be given to the patient to unload uh, a specific uh, side of the knee joint uh, that may be uh, more problematic um, to direct the stress, say, off the inside and uh, place the stress more to the outside, and that may alleviate the symptoms as well. So you consider all options before you really, the ultimate, the ultimate choice then is the, is the joint replacement. And, yes. um, and so I think it's important for people to understand that there are options available before you consider that. And after the break, we're going to come back and talk about uh, the surgical procedures for, for both hip and uh, knee total joint replacement. This kid died from using illegal drugs. And this kid died from using prescription painkillers. Now you tell me, which one's more dead? Talk to your kids about prescription drug abuse. Welcome back to You and Your Health. I'm your host, David Bertone. We're speaking today with Dr. Michael Cunningham, an orthopedic surgeon, and we're talking about osteoarthritis and the possible need for joint and uh, hip joint and knee joint replacement surgery. Dr. Cunningham, again, thanks for coming. Thank you. We're, we're talking about the, um, the workup in terms of the patient for uh, joint replacement surgery. Let's get into the specifics of 
when you do a total hip replacement surgery. What, what are some of the uh, prosthetics that are involved and what are some of the expectations that sure. people should have? Sure. In the, uh, the hip replacement uh, surgery, I'll show a model here. What we, uh, what we typically uh, do is replace the worn out portion of the acetabulum, which is the cup side of the pelvis, with a new prosthetic cup. Now these cups can be of different materials and designs. The one that is shown here is a uh, metal cup. And so this cup is usually what we call press fit or actually pressed into that uh, acetabula space and achieves a very tight fit. Uh, on the femoral side or the thigh bone side, there is a stem which is uh, placed down the shaft of the femur bone or the thigh bone and onto that stem we place the ball and this can also be many different types of materials in this case it is a metal one so that the two will articulate back with each other in the fashion of a normal uh, hip joint. Now, how long does a procedure like that typically take when you do the surgery? Uh, the length of the procedure varies, and it can depend on uh, the difficulty level given the severity of the deformity with the patient, but typically it can last uh, one to two hours. And you talked about some of the materials. When you say metal, what type of metal is it? Is it an alloy? Is it a titanium? People often have that question. There are many, there are, that's a good question, and there are uh, different metals that can be used. Uh, alloys are very common, and they're a cobalt chromium type alloy. Additionally, there is also titanium, which is used. Now, um, both of them can be used in similar applications. Uh, the choice is really left up to the operating surgeon to what he feels is the best choice of metal to use. Uh, during that procedure. In addition to the metal alloys, there are also other composite type materials such as ceramic materials or combination metal ceramics which can also be used. And again, this is left up to the surgeon's preference. And is there a gold standard or is, it, is there something that lasts longer or has better wear or a better function when you make that determination? Well, in, on, on today's uh, prosthetics, uh, there really is very little difference between many of the uh, leading manufactured brands. They're all of very high quality and the studies don't actually point to any one bearing material being substantially better than another bearing material at the present point in time. Uh, and so we cannot uh, unilaterally say to use one type of a material over another. Now, I know years ago there used to be a debate about using cement and not using cement. Is that still an issue, and, and do you mm -hmm. still use cement in certain cases? Cement is still used uh, in both the hip and the knee. We very rarely now, however, do we cement the acetabular side or the cup side of the hip joint because of the success rate of the uncemented cup. The stem on the hip can be either cemented or cementless, again, depending upon the patient uh, and the surgeon's preference. Uh, the same can be said for the knee. The knee joint uh, will typically uh, be cemented in many cases, but again, it can also be uncemented. All right, so let's, let's move on to the, to the knee joint if we can in terms of the knee replacement and what's involved with that particular surgery. Take us through a little bit about the different components um, and mm -hmm. what you use to make that decision. Sure. The uh, front of the knee is covered by the kneecap or the patella. And in this model here, there's been a plastic shaped dome which has been placed on the surface of the patella. So this is a patella replacement uh, which is done in conjunction with the rest of the surgery. There are, however, some instances, again, given the surgeon's preference and the, the patients uh, that are uh, being operated upon, uh, cases where the patella may not be resurfaced or may be left alone. 
the femoral side uh, or the thigh bone side of the knee joint is typically uh, covered with a uh, metallic or a composite material which has the shape of the original femur or distal uh, and the end of the thigh bone, which is a curved shape so that once we replace the tibial side or the, th the shin bone side of the knee with a metal tray, we will place a usually a plastic or a composite material component on top of the metal tray so that it acts as a spacer between the two metal portions and then the knee will articulate in a very natural fashion together at the joint and the kneecap will lay on top of that as well making a very smooth and flexible joint. Now, in terms of the length of procedure for the knee, is it similar to the hip? Is it a little bit more complicated, or are there differences there? The time frame is approximately the same. Okay. And um, in terms of uh, precautions, when you make the decision or you have the conversation with the patient, it's time to do the joint replacement surgery, mm -hmm. are there things that are, are kind of contraindicated that you would say you may not be a good candidate for a joint replacement surgery at this time? Um, and then also talk briefly about some of the things that people need to worry about after the surgery in terms of precautions. Sure. Well, one of the things that we worry about most as joint replacement uh, surgeons is the presence of infection. So if a patient has had an infection in the joint which is under consideration for surgery, it may well be a contraindication or a reason not to perform that surgery. Now, that being said, if the patient has had the, sur the infection cleared up and it's been a very long time and the consultants, including an infectious disease consultant, uh, is comfortable with proceeding, then it's probably okay. But that would be one reason not to do okay. a joint replacement. Other reasons uh, not to do a joint replacement would be the overall medical status of the patient. Every patient uh, needs to be healthy enough in order to undergo the rigorous surgery. And if a patient uh, is not in the cardiovascular state to undergo a major surgery, that would be a contraindication. Okay. Now, what about after the surgery? What are some of the things that people need to be uh, concerned about um, in both the hip and the knee replacements? After the surgery, we have to take things rather slowly at first. Uh, typically, a patient will be in the hospital for a few days, up to three to four days, and then they will move to what we call a subacute rehab setting, or in some cases, an acute rehab setting, where they will start to undergo a uh, physical therapy and training program. Uh, now, this involves with the knee um, basically progressive uh, range of motion and gait training. Uh, we have to be careful, depending upon the type of implant that's put in, that it is not stressed too heavily during the early stages of the rehab. Mm -hmm. And similarly with the hip, we have to be cautious about certain positions that the hip is allowed to go into after the surgery because it's no longer locked in as well as the original hip was, but can have a tendency to sometimes pop out of the socket. And the patient has to learn the positions uh, that they should avoid in order to allow that happening. And this is an important part of the, uh, the post-operative rehab process for a, uh, for a hip replacement. Yeah, I know when I see a, a patient post-op like that, it's, <clears throat> it's very important, number one, for me to communicate with the surgeon about his expect or her expectations in terms of precautions, but then relaying that information to the patient in simple terms. Things like, you know, not bending forward and tying their shoes, you know, not twisting on it, not crossing their legs, simple things like that um, that can cause the hip to dislocate. Now, how, how often does that really occur? I mean, I, in my 22-year career, I think I've only seen one hip joint actually dislocate. Mm, right. is, it, is it still pretty rare? I think that it's getting uh, more and more rare. Um, the designs of the components have changed. We've changed some of the sizing of the uh, 
heads or the, the balls that we use on the, ends of the s on the ends of the stems typically. And this all acts to make it a more stable joint. And uh, so we're seeing less and less dislocations in, in the more modern era. Okay, and another common question people want to know is, uh, what can they go back to? What are the expectations in terms of their functional level? And what are the things they absolutely need to avoid? Right. Well, most people can get back to a, uh, a moderate level of activity. Um, as far as sporting types of activities are concerned, uh, golf, swimming, light tennis, uh, bowling, things of that nature are, are fine. Of course, none of us as joint surgeons like to see a patient go and play f tackle football <laughs> or uh, rough competitive sports. Uh, we all kind of hold our breath when the patient says they want to do that. But the low impact, uh, light kinds of uh, recreational activities are perfectly acceptable. In fact, that's the whole goal, to be able to get the patient back to an active lifestyle so that he can do the kinds of activities that they really get enjoyment from. So jumping out of a plane is not something they should be doing? Unless you're an ex-president, I would say <laughs> no. <laughs> Great. Now, in terms of the post-op rehabilitation, obviously my area that, that I work with the patients are, what are some of the expectations um, that you like to see in terms of the patient, in terms of the mobility level and their strength level, um, or in terms of swelling and function that you, that you look for when you work with your therapist? Right. Well, we tend to see a little bit of swelling and a, a little bit of pain postoperatively, but that's normal and expected. And now, with the advances that we're making in surgical techniques, trying to minimize not only the skin incision, but minimize the amount of muscle stripping that's done around the, uh, the joints, both in the hip and the knee. We're tending to minimize those, uh, those issues of postoperative pain and swelling. And the duration of those symptoms is, is much curtailed by these uh, newer techniques that are, e that are continuing to evolve even now. So we tell the patients that they can expect, you know, a, pe a short period of pain and restrictions of motion, but most people are pleasantly surprised by how quickly they start to ramp up as far as their activity levels are concerned with both respect to the hip and the knee. Uh, so that by three or four months, many patients are back to very, uh, very substantial levels of activity, very close to the activity levels that they were at before the surgery. Yeah, no, I definitely see that that has improved over the past 10 years, that the, the soft tissue swelling and the tissue uh, breakdown um, has definitely lessened, so the patient feels better much, much sooner. Yeah. So that's, that's good. Well, great. Well, th uh, Dr. Cunningham, thanks again for joining us. We appreciate you joining you. It's been my health. pleasure. Again, you've been listening to Dr. Michael Cunningham speak about hip and joint replacement surgery. We hope to see you next time here on You and Your Health.